Welcome to episode number two of Women of Hollywoodland, the podcast that explores the feminist dawn of Hollywood. This week, we're going to chat about director Lois Weber. So last week, we talked about Frances Marion, who, amongst other things, was the first female screenwriter to win the Oscar in 1930. And as most of you probably know, the first female director to win the Oscar was Catherine Bigelow in 2009. So it would be easy to conclude that when it comes to directing, women are playing pretty serious catch up, however. Okay, so there were four feature length films made in 1912 and most people agree that the first to be released was Cleopatra, making it the first American feature film. For some reason, there's a misconception around that Birth of a Nation was the first feature, but it definitely wasn't by around two years. The first feature to be directed by an American woman was an adaptation of Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice, released in 1914, so barely two years later and, incidentally, in the same year as Birth of a Nation. So not quite so much catch-up after all. The Merchant of Venice was directed by Lois Weber. She was born in Pennsylvania on June 13th, 1879, into a fairly artsy family. Her dad worked at the Pittsburgh Opera Theatre, and Lois was considered a child prodigy on the piano. She said of her childhood, I don't remember a time when I did not write. Certainly, I've written stories since I could spell at all. She entered theatre as an actress, touring with various stock companies from 1904, and there she met and married actor and director Philip Smalley. Not long after their marriage, Weber retired to become a homemaker, which, as far as I can make out, lasted approximately 20 minutes before she started writing and selling film scenarios from home on a freelance basis. And this led, in 1908, to Weber and Smalley being hired as a kind of writing, directing, producing team by the American Goldman Chronofilm Company. And now, as you might remember from last week, in those days, writing, directing, producing, they were all kind of fluid roles and even the terms interchangeable. And I should mention here that Weber and Smalley did work more or less as a team until they divorced in the early 20s. But it's important to note that everyone, including Smalley himself, saw her as the senior partner and creative brains of the outfit. He used to refer to their joint projects as Mrs. Smalley's picture. So I think it's fair to say that he knew his place. American Gaumont was owned and operated by another husband and wife team, Herbert Blanchet and Alice Guy Blanchet. As I mentioned earlier, Lois Weber was the first American woman to direct a feature length film. Alice Guy Blanchet, who was French, was the first woman to direct a feature. So already we have a little chain emerging here, don't we? Lois Weber gave Frances Marion her start in Hollywood and Alice Guy Blanchet gave Lois Weber hers, which interestingly backs up findings from a 2015 study conducted by the Centre for the Study of Women in Television and Film at San Diego University. They concluded that the best chance women have of being hired in Hollywood is finding a female boss. So you could argue that what's changed in a hundred years is that less women are being hired in Hollywood because less women are there to hire them. After a couple of years, Weber and Smalley moved on to the Rex Motion Picture Company, very quickly becoming what we might call today the kind of creative directors. Rex then amalgamated with five other small companies to form a studio you might have heard of called Universal. And they all moved from New York at that point out to Los Angeles. Now, in the teens, Universal was actually famous for its lady directors. In fact, there were more female directors working at Universal than all the other studios combined. In addition to Lois Weber, the universal women of the teens included Ruth Ann Baldwin, Grace Cunard, Eugenie Magnus Ingleton, Cleo Madison, Ida Mae Park, Ruth Stonehouse, Lily Warrington and Elsie Jane Wilson. And as it happens, within the low bar of today, Universal still doesn't do too badly, hiring 7.1% female directors compared to Paramount's 4.7% or Warner Brothers' 23 It's often argued that this was for reasons of economy. While the top female directors and writers often out-earned their male peers, then, as now, on the whole, 
women tended to work for less and Universal was all about that bottom line. Out of all of the studios in those very early days, Universal was probably the most business and profit minded. So on the one hand, they may have been hiring women because they were cheaper, but on the other, they clearly trusted them to churn out profitable films. Universal City, which is Universal Studios Hollywood today, was a little bit like what the Google complex is to us, kind of more than a workplace, a lifestyle almost, a symbol of a brand new pioneering industry. And in 1913, it elected its own mayor, Lois Weber, who in turn appointed actress Stella Adams as the chief of police. Now, in Women of Early Hollywood, Karen Ward Maher asks, was this feminism or was it spectacle? And to be honest, the jury's out. Some film historians portray Universal's founder and chief, Carl Lemley, as the kind of prototype woke guy, while others are a little bit more cynical. In some ways, I'm reminded of, do you remember a couple of years ago when models at the Chanel show in Paris came down the catwalk waving placards about women's rights? On one hand, it was like Karl Lagerfeld as a feminist icon, um, but on the other, it got people talking and is there not something positive about feminism being powerful and topical enough to be co-opted by fashion? And that's kind of how I see the idea of Universal being the Sweden of early Hollywood. At the very least, it's fascinating that it was seen as a concept that would sell in 1913, because make no mistake, woke or not, Carl Lemley was a businessman through and through. And more than that, he was a bit of a publicity genius, credited, amongst other things, with creating the first movie star. If he was selling even the facade of a female-dominated society, it's because it would sell. At Universal, Lois Weber directed several shorts in the early teens, including Suspense in 1913, which is basically the blueprint for every thriller made since. In fact, it establishes several techniques that Hitchcock tends to get all the credit for, yet while it was being made, Hitchcock was a wee boy at school. The story opens with a housekeeper sneakily quitting her job by leaving a note which reads in a deft piece of exposition that no staff would ever stay in a place so lonesome. So now we have a young wife home alone in the middle of nowhere with a baby and there's a tramp lurking about outside the house. The wife, played by Weber herself, phones her husband to tell him that someone is sneaking about outside and there we have the famous three-way split screen, the first in an American film, in which we see the wife, the husband in his office and the tramp cutting the phone line outside the house. The rest of the film is basically the husband's efforts to get home before the baddie gets his wife. And to be fair, that aspect isn't exactly feminist given that the wife basically sits around the whole time looking scared. But in her defence, she won't even be able to vote for another six years, so I think we can cut her some slack. In his hurry to get to his wife, the husband steals a car, as you do. He just runs out of his office and leaps into the first car he sees. So the whole time, the police and the owner of the car are in pursuit. And it's just beautifully shot. There's one shot where um, it's an angle on the car's side mirror where we kind of see over the husband's shoulder into the mirror and we see the police car gaining on them in the mirror from behind. And I feel as though we often imagine the early silence as a little bit amateur, a bit clunky and many were. But the cinematography in suspense wouldn't be out of place in a movie released today. And the editing too, there's a sequence of really fast jump cuts between the husband in the car to the wife hiding with the baby to the baddie breaking into the house that's just classic movie tension building. Put it this way, half the thriller tropes that scream would one day parody can be found in suspense. And it was the following year that Weber became, as I mentioned, the first American woman to direct a feature with the Merchant of Venice. And she and Smalley then left Universal for the Bosworth Film Company, in part because she wanted to make films with hard hitting social messages. And Universal was all about the cheap and cheerful kind of popcorn movies, even though they wouldn't start selling popcorn at movie theatres until the 30s. But you know what I mean. 
According to film historian Anthony Slade, along with D.W. Griffith, Weber was American cinema's first genuine auteur, a filmmaker who utilised the motion picture to put across her own ideas and philosophies. And her ideas and philosophies were really what drove her. She was a devout Christian and said of her decision to go into the arts, I was convinced that the theatrical profession needed a missionary, so I went onto the stage filled with a great desire to convert my fellow man. And she succeeded. Lois Weber is generally credited with raising cinema from a kind of cheap alternative to vaudeville to an art form capable of tackling hefty social issues. In the late teens, there was what was known as the uplift movement, a concerted effort to release movies of higher social and artistic ideals in a quite deliberate attempt to appease various conservative groups and particularly state censorship boards. Bear in mind this was long before you know the PG and R ratings or any kind of federal regulation of movie releases. Lois Weber was basically the poster child for uplift films, but that said, she wasn't exactly conservative by today's standards. Her films in the teens argued against capital punishment, drew connections between poverty and prostitution, and argued for birth control. Though she did run into state censorship boards fairly regularly, she got clever quite quickly and started inviting prominent social progressives and reformers to early screenings and getting them on side, basically. So she could quite legitimately present her movies as intellectually exploring issues rather than glorifying them. One thing that helped her in all this, and one of the things that I love about her, was that Lois Weber was a lady. Like she had this really dignified, almost Victorian kind of ultra feminine image. In photos, she's invariably in one of those kind of high necked ruffly blouses that you associate with the Dowager Countess of Grantham. She was married, she was middle class, she was well spoken, and all that seemed to help her get away with a lot more than someone who presented as more radical. And the reason that I love the way she dressed and presented herself is, it's just the fact that she clearly felt zero pressure to compromise her femininity in any way. I mean, when I was a trainee director, a lot long after uh, Lois Weber, I remember one day writing notes with a pink pen that for some reason had like glittery things sticking at the top and the production manager pulled me to one side and warned me that if I was to have any hope of being taken seriously as a director, I couldn't write with a pink glittery pen. But Lois Weber, she basically wrote with a pink glittery pen because she wasn't competing in a man's world. It was Lois Weber's world and she did whatever she pleased. Anyway, Weber and Smalley then returned to Universal, where Weber became the highest paid director there. And in 1916, they made Where Are My Children, which was the studio's highest grossing film of the year. Now, I think it's worthwhile exploring it a little bit because it's not the kind of movie I think most people imagine they were making in the teens. And it gives us a glimpse of what a film industry that features prominent female voices could be like. Bear in mind, this film was released 101 years ago. So we have a district attorney. At the beginning of the film, he's involved in a case in which a doctor is being tried for, quote, distributing lewd material, pamphlets educating the poor on birth control. The doctor testifies as to the destitution and heartbreak he sees in his work in the poor areas of the city caused by people being unable to plan their families. He tells of one patient who killed herself when the baby she can't afford to feed properly dies. Now, you could argue that it's all a bit patriarchal, a bit judgmental by 2017 standards, but still, it's pretty stark about the reality of having millions of babies while poor. And further, the judgment is curiously ungendered. In 1916, it seems, we were aware that it takes two to tango. Anyway, the doctor gets sent down and interestingly, the title card specifies that a jury of men rejected the case. In 1916, women weren't legally eligible to sit on juries, so it could have gone without saying that men convicted him. It strikes me as more than a wee bit pointed that it doesn't. The second storyline is about the district attorney's wife and her friends. They're all society women who basically just don't want pregnancy to interrupt their cocktail parties. And to be fair, the film is pretty judgy about them. But again, 1916, as moral lines in the sand go, it's not unreasonable in the context. The fact that it acknowledges that women who just don't want kids exist is pretty progressive in and of itself. 
Then the wife's brother comes to stay and he rapes the maid's daughter. Whether or not it is strictly rape in a legal sense in 1916, there is no bones about the fact that he is a predatory creep from the first instance we see him. The maid's daughter becomes pregnant and the district attorney's wife takes her to her special doctor, but this time the doctor screws up and the maid's daughter dies. The doctor is then put on trial. I think it's for manslaughter, but it's slightly vague given that performing abortions at all at the time is illegal. And he's sentenced to 15 years hard labour. As a final act of revenge, though, he gives the DA his patient book, who, of course, right away sees his wife's name appearing several times. And he condemns his wife and all her friends. But to me, it's not totally clear that this is the film's point of view as much as it's the comeuppance of a hypocrite who's happy for poor people's breeding to be controlled, but horrified that his own wife doesn't want to pop out kids at a Pez dispenser. And one of the most striking aspects of Where Are My Children is simply how thought-provoking it is. The Weber herself said time and time again that she was here to preach. This film really doesn't. It more just sets out things that happen when women can't control whether or not they're pregnant. And if there is one unequivocal message in it, it's that if abortions are going to happen, let's make sure that they don't kill women, which, whatever you stand personally on the issue, I think is a message we can all get behind. Effectively, perhaps even rightly, There was loads of controversy upon the release of Where Are My Children, with several states banning it. But it was also a huge hit, with crowds in New York being turned away after lining up outside cinemas for days at a time and still not getting into screenings. As I mentioned, it was one of the highest grossing films of the year. The following year, in 1917, Lois Weber established her own studio, becoming the first female director to do so. This was announced in a brilliant ad reading, Producing independently in my own studio, Lois Weber Productions, for distribution on their merits. By this time, it was established that Weber was the writer-director. Smalley was officially made the studio manager. In the same year, Weber became the first woman to be accepted into the newly formed Motion Pictures Directors Association. However, by 1920 or so, her films were starting to be released to mixed reviews and she was struggling more and more to finance them. As Weber's biographer Shelley Stamp says, her films started to be seen as didactic instead of revolutionary, preachy instead of radical. The film industry in general did hit a bit of a financial roadblock in the early 20s. The US was in the post-war recession, just as filmmaking was becoming more sophisticated and more expensive. And Lois Weber seems to have been hit one of the hardest. Part of the issue was just that times were changing. By 1921-22, the jazz age was in full swing and people just weren't interested in socially worthy movies. Her career did limp on throughout the 20s. She made a couple of kind of comebacks, but with less and less success. She did continue to write and briefly ran Universal's story department in the late 20s. But after 1922, she was never one of the top echelon of directors again. She died from a stomach ulcer in 1939, destitute, with her sister and her protégé screenwriter Frances Marion at her bedside. Frances Marion then organised and paid for her funeral, proving once again that when the chips are down, it's your girlfriend you can count on. Now, to a certain extent, her story is far from uncommon in Hollywood. I mean, how many directors, writers, stars can we all think of who are everywhere for a few years, then suddenly never heard from again? But rarely is a filmmaker as impactful as Lois Weber, as forgotten as she was. In Lois Weber in Early Hollywood, Shelley Stamp says, Over the following two decades, the process of marginalising, then ultimately forgetting Weber's work, alongside that of many other women active in Early Hollywood, only accelerated. Stamp reports that in 1927, the magazine Moving Picture World described Weber as, quote, the only woman ever to achieve success as a motion picture director, an astonishing erasure of historical record. So it seems as though this wasn't just a question of one director's career floundering, but of quite a systemic attempt to rewrite history. Both Griffith and DeMille, the two directors whose careers most resembled um, Weber's, would both release turkeys at times and struggle, particularly with the transition to sound. 
but they're both still venerated and certainly remembered as the fathers of cinema. And perhaps even more importantly, Lois Weber was no aberration. She was certainly the top, certainly one of the most influential directors, but she was far from the only woman working behind the scenes in Hollywood at the time. And we'll discuss that a little bit more next week. Thanks again for listening to episode number two of Women of Hollywoodland. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did and you could spare a moment to rate, review, share, subscribe, it would really, really be appreciated. You can also find out more about this episode and the whole Hollywoodland project at hollywoodlandseries.com. And please feel free to leave any comments, questions, thoughts or anything else you'd like to say there. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks again and see you next week. Women of Hollywoodland was written, edited and produced by me, Claire Duffy. It's part of the Hollywoodland project and if you'd like any more information on that, just pop along to hollywoodlandseries.com.